Hey, what's up guys? Phoenix here, and this video is going to be a little discussion type video on the February 5th, 2018 format, and as you can tell by the title, it is going to be about why Apocalyphort Towers doesn't matter and why Cleaforts won't be relevant, because I've been getting asked about this deck a lot because I've covered it several times on my channel in the past, both with Demise Clee when the deck was heavily hindered, back when the deck was being released, I think I did a couple of videos on it back then, I wasn't really very active on my channel back then, but I think I did a video or two on it. Um, I did a video or two on it during Necro's format. Um, I'm basically very well, like, n I know this deck inside and out, basically, because I've both experimented with it and played against it through all of its various forms. Uh, I've seen plenty of how the deck has tried to adapt and innovate and all that sort of stuff. And basically, the deck, unfortunately, is pretty outclassed in 2018. But this video is going to be divided up into two separate parts that I'm going to discuss in terms of topics that will be discussed separately because even though it all pertains to Cleaforts as the archetype, there are basically two separate decks that this deck runs as. There's Towers Turbo with Towers back in the game or the Towers variants and then there is Cleafort Demise because of Carter Demise being legal and the fact that this deck really likes playing with floodgates and trap cards and strapping the helmet on real tight. So basically I'm going to be looking at both of these different areas of the deck separating this discussion down into the core main two topics of why Towers doesn't matter, meaning Towers Turbo isn't going to be doing anything, and then the rest of the video is just why Cleaforts won't matter, and that will be encompassing the other versions of the deck as well, like the Stun variants, the Demise variants, and what have you. So, basically, first topic, why Apocalyphort Towers does not matter. It doesn't matter because you have to really look at the card in terms of the context of when it was banned, when it was forbidden. Back in 2014 and 2015, when the card was announced in 2014, there was only a handful of cards that could even out this card in the entirety of the game of Yu-Gi-Oh! that would single-handedly out this card, um, even requiring some other, like, extenuating circumstances. Uh, they, you could count the outs to this card back in those times on legitimately two hands. There was, like, 10 to 11 outs total in the entire game of Yu-Gi-Oh! So this card was very powerful on release, and back then we had Shadal's, Burning Abyss, and Necro's respectively as best decks during their own respective formats when this card came out. Now, Burning Abyss could handle this card by simply stalling because it had triple graph, triple seer. Uh, it could try to prevent the card from coming out because of how powerful Fire Lake was. But if the card hit the board, Burning Abyss did not have a built-in engine out to this card for a very long time. We had to rely on things like Mask Change 2 into Koga if your opponent messed up and put another monster on the field just so that Koga would be a big enough monster to crash into towers. And then you had the other builds that were playing Rank Up Magic Astral Force, which could be used on a Dante to make a Pleiades, or you could use it on a Chronomaly Chronograph or whatever its name is, Co Cosmonaut or something like that. It's a Rank 3. And you could rank that up into Heraldry Crest of Horror, which was a 4,000 attack monster, would become 35 and could punch over the towers. Now, these were decent outs, but they weren't reliable because you had to draw into them, or in the case of Astral Force, the more reliable of the two, you had to mill the card, and then you had to add it to your hand and basically stunt one of your turns for, uh, for a portion of the game, just to have the out just chilling in your hand. But the thing with towers was that it didn't really give you that many turns to mess around because every turn it was taking a monster out of your hand uh, and that was uh, that was pretty that was pretty problematic now later when we got into Necro's time Necro's had a built-in out to towers in the form of Necro's a decisive armor which could be used on a Trishula or a Valkyrius or if there was a Dweller out it could be used on any of the guys you were summoning that wasn't Clausalus and you were able to hit over the towers in that way but basically the only real reliable out we had to towers during that time frame was exclusive to North America, the jump promo Diamond Crab King. That was not accessible to the rest of the world in terms of the TCG territories, and that was a huge problem during that time because Diamond Crab King was the most reliable and easiest way to out towers because we had access to just making rank 4s. It was so easy to make a rank 4 in the face of a towers, usually. And Diamond Crab King made itself become 3k, meaning that it was already being uh, it was already being taken down by 500, and the becoming 3k made it to where it did not have any attack loss by the towers. It was a 3k versus 3k situation. Because when you make an attack become 3000 after a continuous effect is already being applied to it, the continuous effect doesn't magically start applying again. The attack goes to 3k and the continuous effect was already being applied. 
So basically, this card now has infinite number of outs to it in the format. So if you're playing a deck like Towers Turbo, which was pretty decent in its prime because there were so few outs to it, you could easily steal games with it. If you're trying to play a deck like this now that focuses on towers, you're going to find out just how more volatile the entirety of the game is to a card like Towers. And so Towers just has no real place in the format. You have the entirety of the Link mechanic that deals with Towers, because Towers has no inherent built-in protection from Link monsters, because how would it? Those cards didn't exist for years until after Tower was even thought of. So basically, the entirety of the Link mechanic can out this card. Firewall Dragon can bounce it, Ningirsu can send it, Trigate can banish it, all of these different things. There's way too many outs in the form of just the most powerful mechanic that we're currently abusing to actually out Towers. Now, the next thing is that we have Kaijus. Even without the Link mechanic, we have Kaijus that can distribute over Towers at any given point. Now, Towers is at least a little bit better situated against Kaijus because you might be able to hit a Kaiju out of your opponent's hand before they have a turn if you dropped Towers, but that is, uh, that's very unreliable to rely on of hitting a Kaiju out of your opponent's hand because then it would have to be like the only monster in their hand or something like that to guarantee hitting it. And just there's just a whole rigmarole of things that are not good reasons why you should be trying to summon Towers in a Kaiju format. And then outside of that we have generic synchros that like decks try to make it every twist and turn like crystal wing synchro dragon that outs towers there are just so many outs to towers in this game and i never thought that i would actually see the day where a card like that that was such an oppressive force when it was released that we were all freaking out about has so many outs to it that it's not even worth considering running uh, it's a very interesting thing to think about is that to Towers is actually just an incredibly fragile card, and the card could have come back a long time ago, actually. It's it's so weird. It's definitely safe, completely safe to be back now, because it doesn't matter that the card is at 1, 2, or 3, because it's outed by the entire mechanic that's being pushed by Konami right now. So there's no way the card can see any real competitive success, because every single deck is going to be having some form of Link monsters in it that can deal with it. On top of the fact that even without using a Link monster to out it in form of effect, we've got things like Decode Talker, which can pump themselves up really big, and that's like a generic Link in almost every deck that has any Link monster in it. You can just summon Deco Talker and have two cards in their zones. It becomes big. You can just you have so many different ways to out towers uh, in these sorts of forms. There's so many ways to do it. You can bore load take towers. That's even disrespectful. But I digress. I could keep talking about this for a lot longer, but I think you get the point. Is that towers could be at three by this point. Towers turbo variants are not going to be doing well because you might do like well at a locals where people aren't prepared on how they can out towers. But essentially, the card has a huge flaw and a huge weakness, and that is that it has to deal with kaijus, and it's completely you know, unprotected from an entire mechanic. And that's a flaw that extends to the rest of the Cleefort monsters in the regular Klee decks as well, which is pretty much as best a time as any to transition into the next part of this video. And that is the second topic of why Cleeforts in general will not be relevant. Now, there are a lot of people that think Demise Klee or Klee's with Wavering Eyes or whatever will be uh, relevant again because of Sacrifice being unrestricted on this ban list alongside Towers coming back. But unfortunately, Scout is still at 1, so this deck still has a huge amount of consistency problems, and that consistency problem sort of gets solved by Wavering Eyes. Except the problem is is that this deck falls into the same category as every other Pendulum deck that is getting hurt by Master Rule 4, and that is that Wavering Eyes in your scales is not broken anymore. That's why the card came from 0 to 3 immediately. Like, Wavering Eyes in your scales to search Scout and then immediately use Scout to get another scale is not broken. It's not good anymore. You're going to be Penduluming one of those cards. You're not going to be Penduluming two anymore. You have to Pendulum from hand if you're going to be trying to do anything else, make, uh, make Towers live, any of that sort of stuff. You're not going to be able to do it. It's very hard for you as the player to get resources and run away with games now. It's so much harder than it was a couple of years back. Even like last summer before Link format, Link era hit, before Master Rule 4 went into an effect. At least then you could try to play Demise Klee, and you could at least, you know, steal games through Pendulum Summoning through Wars of Attrition, and then also gaining advantage through Card of Demise. Unfortunately, that's just not the case anymore. And then we move on to Demise Klee for it. Demise Klee for it got inherently worse with Master Rule 4, not even because of the Pendulum restriction on the extra monster zone. 
Cleefort Demise got so much worse because of the fact that you now have no extra pendulum zones apart from your spells and traps. You're going to scale scout, and you're going to scale another card potentially, and you're going to card a Demise. You're going to end up discarding a lot more cards than you used to. The thing about Demise Clee that made it so powerful was the fact that scout was a card that could search for either spells or traps, meaning that you could set up your board with putting every card on your board that you could. Normal, normal summoning a Klee monster, scaling scout, scaling another Klee, setting two back row if that's what your hand was, playing Demise, drawing three cards, and then based off what those three cards were, you could use scout to unload your hand almost every single time and get full value. You could use scout to search for laser clip, play it, normal summon another monster if that's what you drew. You could set back row uh, if you had... If you didn't draw enough back row, you could use Scout to search for Recreate, set that, and then you could discard the cards out of your hand if they weren't back row related, if they were just monster related. There were so many different good things about Cleefort Demise during that time before Master Rule 4. Now, unfortunately, that's not the case, and it's the same sort of restriction that's hurting both Metal Foes and other Pendulum decks, but it really hurts Cleefort because with Scout at 1, the deck is inherently inconsistent. There's not really a lot that you can do with it, other than try to run it as a stun based deck with Demise and Floodgates and stuff, but then you just run out of space. You do not have the space to resolve amazing things anymore, and again, you cannot win that War of Attrition with your opponent just by Pendulum summoning two or three cards a turn and then tributing for them. It's very hard for you to get monsters on the field now, it's very hard for you to summon towers. Towers inherently doesn't mesh well with the entirety of Master Rule 4 because it's hard for you to put a lot of cards on the field, because of the way the Pendulum mechanic now interacts with not being able to summon from the extra deck more than one monster unless you have access to Cleefort Genius on your field. Cleefort Genius is hard enough to make because you have to do things like use Laser Clip to bypass your normal summon because Cleeforts are way too restrictive in terms of what they allow you to do because their scales all prevent you from special summoning anything that's not a Cleefort monster. So you have just so much against you in terms of what you're trying to accomplish to make the deck operate. It's almost like the deck is fighting itself, and it's unfortunate because this deck was a very well-designed, like, Pendulum archetype, albeit that it was basically used as more of a stunnish archetype that just got free advantage because of Scout and the Pendulum mechanic and the way the things interact, but it was like a Pendulum Monarch deck. It was cool in design, even though you may have some salty memories about playing against it. But essentially, the entirety of the deck is outclassed by other better options at this point. If you were going to try and play Towers Turbo, you're better off playing some true Draco variant because all of the cards in that deck are inherently better. Masterpiece may not be protected from everything, but it is protected from Link Monsters if you tribute a monster for it. It's protected from spells and traps, depending on what you tributed for it. And it also forms a protection layer for itself by popping a card when it was tribute summoned, so that's that's fantastic. It's big enough to be a towers. It is the new towers. It is outclassed towers in every way, and the card quality in terms of what the true Draco deck has access to, and the fact that you can mesh other archetypes with true Draco is exactly why that deck outclasses towers turbo. So if you were trying to play Klee for that reason, true Draco and any sort of true Draco variant is going to be better for you in the long run because Masterpiece is just a power crept towers. And then if you're trying to play a stun Klee deck, like Klee Demise or whatever, you're better off playing a deck like Demise Paleo or something like that. I'll specifically run with the, the Demise Paleo example because Demise Paleo, while it is a trap archetype, it at least has a better endgame than Demise Klee does because Klee Demise, all you're doing is summoning essentially vanillas, you're trying to gain slow incremental advantage through floodgating with trap cards and then using your tribute effects of the dudes you're tributing for bigger monsters. Stuff like that. It's very, it's a very cut and dry game plan. Meanwhile, Demise Paleo has everything that Klee Demise has. It doesn't rely on playing Demise to gain a huge amount of its advantage, and all of these traps are super relevant in terms of disruption. At least most of them are. All of the traps, when you activate them, become plus ones, so it gains incremental advantage faster than the Klee deck does by bringing back your traps from Grave. And then you have quality cards like Swap Frog and Ronin Toten and Dupe Frog in your deck that combine with the trap cards to make things like Totally Awesome's turn one, and that's actually a boss monster. That's a card that negates cards. Instead of using Scout to search a card that quite literally has no effect on the field, and then trying to hide behind whatever floodgates or traps you drew, you could apply all of those same principles to the Paleozoic deck, and it is infinitely better in execution in terms of a stun deck because you actually 
get incremental advantage and then do more things with that incremental advantage. You close out games faster with a Paleo deck than you do with Klee's. So True Draco and True Draco variants are literally just better than Tower's Turbo. And then Paleo and other Demise decks of the current day are just better than Klee Demise as it stands. And those are the only two ways that you can really play Klee's because of how restrictive the archetype was designed because it was the first Pendulum archetype to be designed that was released in a core set that was meant to be competitive. They were taking a lot of baby steps with how they wanted to design Pendulums. This was very much a Generation 1 Pendulum deck. It was the first competitively viable Pendulum deck, and Konami was scared of the mechanic that they had created, rightfully so, because once you get up to like Gen 3, Gen 4 Pendulums, you end up with things like Magicians and Full Power Pepe. So like the archetype and the mechanic of, um, of Pendulums that Cleeforts were trying to abuse was very much in its baby steps, and they wanted to make sure that it wasn't super abusable, but that just turned it into a stun-based archetype that could just drop big beefy boss monsters. Like I said, it was quite literally Pendulum Monarchs. Uh, but basically, the deck has no real place in the format. Even if Scout was at 3, it wouldn't really matter. We can look to the OCG for this. The OCG has Klee's at damn near full power. I actually don't think there's any Klee Fort related cards on their Forbidden and Limited list anymore. I think Scout's at 3, Sacrifice at 3, Tower's at 3, all that. I think they have everything at 3. There might be one obscure thing that they have 2 or 1 of, but it doesn't really affect much because Scout is, in fact, at 3 in the OCG. And the deck does nothing. There's just so many things that have been released that operate on the same axis as whatever version Cleefort deck you'd be playing and just do it better, get better incremental advantage, get better abuse out of Card of Demise, get better end-game procedures of how they're trying to close out the game, all that sort of stuff. So, unfortunately, like I said, Apocalyphort Towers, it doesn't matter that it's off the Forbidden Limited list. It arguably could have come back much sooner and Cleeforts will not be relevant at anything higher than a locals level. It might get a random regional top here or there to an unprepared crowd, but it's nothing that's going to be de largely defining the format at YCS level events or anything like that. So that's basically the unfortunate matter of business to all the people that are really excited about having more Klee cards back. But it's just the nature of the game. Power creep happens in Yu-Gi-Oh! and things get displaced. There are some decks that will never be power crept and will always be on the Forbidden and Limited list, but Klee Forts are definitely not one of those decks because of them being a Gen 1 Pendulum deck. They were already very restrictive from the start, and now they're combating against Master Rule 4, which restricts them even further. So, anyway, that's going to be it for this video. I hope you enjoyed these little casual discussion videos. Let me know if you like them in the comments down below and all that sort of stuff. Any feedback would be greatly appreciated. But other than that, as always, guys, thanks for watching. Like, comment, subscribe to all the nonsense you usually do. Check out the links in the description if you want to connect with me or chat with me or watch me on other forms of media like Twitch or Facebook or whatever. All that sort of stuff. But other than that, as I've already said, thanks for watching. Thanks for your time as usual, guys. And take care. I'll see you in the next video. But now that the video's over, I'd like to give special thanks to my patrons, Iradium, Yuki Phoenix, Troy Perkins, Eric Gertson, Tour Guides Guy, and Ringleader, as well as everybody else supporting in the lower tiers. You guys help make what I'm doing here continue to be possible. You have my eternal gratitude, as always, and you're forever awesome. Thank you so much for the support, you guys.